Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the third quarter 2020 Winnebago Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participant lines are in the listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star than one on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star than zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Steve Suber, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator. And good morning, everyone, for joining us today to discuss our fiscal year 20 third quarter earnings results. I am joined on the call today by Michael Happy, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Brian Hughes, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. This call is being broadcast live on our website at investor.wgo.net, and a replay of the call will be available on our website later today. The news release with our third quarter results was issued and posted to our website earlier this morning. Before we start, I'd like to remind you that certain statements made during today's conference call regarding Winnebago Industries and its operations may be considered forward-looking statements under securities laws. The company cautions you that forward-looking statements involve a number of risks and are inherently uncertain and a number of factors, many of which are beyond the company's control, could cause actual results to differ materially from these statements. These factors are identified in our SEC filings, which I encourage you to read. With that, I would now like to turn the call over to our President and CEO, Michael Happy. Mike? Thank you, Steve. And good morning to everyone on today's call. It's hard to believe how much has transpired in the last three months since we uh, held a similar event. We sincerely hope that each of you and your families this morning are staying safe and healthy during these unique times. And we especially appreciate your interest in Winnebago Industries and in taking the time to join us this morning. Today, I will briefly share with you what Winnebago Industries has been doing relative to COVID-19 and then provide an overview of our third quarter results and our perspective on the balance of our fiscal year 2020. I'll then turn the call over to Brian Hughes, who will provide more details on the financial results. I will then return to offer some closing comments before we conclude the call with our Q&A session. Before we begin today's discussion, I would like to offer a variety of thanks relative to our ongoing navigation of the coronavirus pandemic. First, Brian and I want to thank our more than 5,000 employees in the Winnebago Industries family of brands for their impressive response to the COVID-19 environment as we continue the process of returning to work in a thoughtful and safe manner. In the face of uncertainty and dynamic market conditions, our teammates continue to demonstrate resilience, determination, and care daily as we balance productivity and efficiency with safety and health. There have been countless moments of inspiration as our employees make cloth masks, face shields, contribute to fellow employee assistance funds, and engage our communities with acts of charity to help their neighbors. In the face of these challenges, the commitment and dedication of our team have been essential to our ongoing pursuit of the vision to make Winnebago Industries a leading provider of outdoor lifestyle solutions a reality. Secondly, we would like to thank the first responders, healthcare providers, public health officials, and local leaders in the communities our employees live, work, and play in. These stakeholders have played a vital role in ensuring that the counties, cities, and towns we call home are navigating through this pandemic crisis as effectively as possible, and ensuring that those most vulnerable to this challenging virus are protected and cared for as much as possible. Thank you to these everyday heroes. Now, prior to the impact of COVID-19, Winnebago Industries was well on its way to driving strong financial results for fiscal year 2020 and building on the momentum we had created the last several years. 
As we discussed on our last call in mid-March, as COVID-19 related stay-at-home orders were put in place across the country, we began to witness significant disruptions across most of our dealer network, supply chain, and to our end consumers. In response, we took immediate and decisive actions to control costs and maintain our financial strength and flexibility by making the tough but necessary decision the week of March 23rd to temporarily suspend most production activities across all our facilities. At one point in time, we had more than 4,000 employees, unfortunately, furloughed. Beginning with our specialty vehicles and Chris Craft businesses in mid-April, our full portfolio of Winnebago Industries businesses eventually resumed production activities in a disciplined and graduated manner during the month of May. As consumers began to emerge from stay-at-home orders and as other COVID-19 related constraints were lifted that affected our dealer networks, our company started the process of adapting to new safety protocols and establishing a new normal operationally as we return to work. The most important aspect of this new reality has been to ensure the health and safety of our employees and other key stakeholders as we work to ramp up production across our portfolio. This includes educating and training our employees on best practices to prevent the spread of the coronavirus inside and outside the workplace and developing a longer term plan to manage through potential future waves of the pandemic. This is a daily battle to guard against social complacency and fatigue along with inconsistent outside leadership messaging and role modeling to embrace the proper protocols that keep our employees and their families safe. Along with our Vice President of Enterprise Operations, Chris West, I have had the opportunity now to visit almost all of our facilities across the company to witness firsthand how our employee health protocols are being blended with the productivity needed to meet rising demand. In fact, I hit the road in one of our Winnebago branded Class B vans for the trip to Indiana last month, experiencing the feeling so many Americans are now demanding of being outdoors in a safe manner. During this period, we also developed a comprehensive plan to help us identify COVID-19 related supply chain risks and mitigating activities to help our brands manage through the disruption on a sustained basis. Coordination and close communication with our vendors and supply chain partners allowed us to stay in lockstep throughout this process and was a key element in our successful restart in May. While still managing through some delivery challenges here and there, most of our supply chain remains reliably reliable currently. We are also using the crisis proactively as well to continue to improve the efficiency of our operations to recommit to higher levels of discipline and production planning versus confirmed orders and right-sizing our fixed costs to our future business prospects and profitability aspirations. We have also remained in close contact with our dealers to monitor and assess how the pandemic impacted their businesses and what changes in consumer buying behaviors they are and were seeing in real time. Our dealers have been truly extraordinary during these last 100 days, facing what appeared to be initially an existential crisis in April, adapting quickly to engaging consumers in a digital fashion to meet available demand, and then ramping up safely with their teams to meet what has now emerged as an unexpected but highly welcomed strong wave of first-time RVers and boaters this late spring and summer. We continue to work hard every day to serve the needs of our dealers in a superlative fashion. And we want to say thank you to those channel partners for their continued support of our brands. Finally, we continue to prioritize a disciplined approach to our financial management of the company as we closely follow the market to stay ahead of any significant disruptions. As the impact of COVID-19 continues to evolve, we are confident that we have sufficient cash on hand 
and liquidity to navigate the crisis while remaining committed to keeping our team safe as we continue to support our dealer partners and consumers. We are also highly aware of the debt structure we have here at the company and are working diligently with Brian's leadership to ensure that our future leverage strategy is considerate of any profitable growth opportunities, but is especially designed to navigate any unanticipated business disruptions that could occur in the future. Undoubtedly, the past few months have been a challenging time for everyone in the outdoors industry and for Winnebago Industries specifically. Our entire third quarter really straddled the worst of the pandemic's impact to date within the U.S. I believe we're the first RV company to report for the months of March through May. If you break down RV industry performance on a monthly basis, in March we saw a 20.2% decline in retail sales compared to the prior year, and most notable was April, where the industry experienced a 53% retail decline over the prior year period. I will speak in more detail in the closing comment sections, but we have seen an incredible rebound in retail demand and dealer demand since early May across all our businesses, as you can see by the backlog numbers referenced in our release. In fact, we received this morning our latest retail for the, for the latest week in June, and it's as high a comp percentage as we have seen in the recovery to date. We have continued to revise our production rates on various product, product lines to ensure that we can meet that demand in a disciplined, safe manner in future quarters. We believe the current momentum in the marketplace is seasonally sustainable for the remainder of our fiscal year and potentially through the rest of the calendar year. Turning now to our consolidated results for the third quarter, which again span the most intense portion of the COVID-19 pandemic to date in the U.S. Consolidated revenues for Winnebago Industries were $402.5 million for the third quarter of fiscal 2020, down approximately 24% versus the same period in fiscal 2019. Excluding Numar, consolidated revenues were $314.5 million, down approximately 41%. Even while dealing with the impacts of COVID-19, our grand design business, Numar branded motorhomes, and our Winnebago branded Class B products all continue to build on their trend of gaining market share. Our ability to outperform the market is consistent with trends we were seeing prior to the pandemic, and we are optimistic that we will continue to do so in the final quarter of the fiscal year 2020. Year-to-date operating cash flow was $162 million, an increase of 96% versus the same period in fiscal 2019. As a result of implementing measures to preserve cash, including taking advantage of our highly variable cost structure, curtailing our capital spend, and executive and employee compensation cuts, we have been able to grow our cash levels in the quarter another $30 million to an end of May position of approximately $152 million. As important, our $193 million ABL facility remains untapped. Now let us turn to the segments in more detail. In the towable segment, revenues of $189 million for the quarter were down 46% from the prior year period, primarily driven by the suspension of manufacturing and the disruption of consumer buying patterns related to the COVID pandemic. The appeal of our Grand Design and Winnebago branded towable products has allowed us to once again outpace the industry and gain retail market share. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 8.7% in the quarter, largely reflecting the leverage and cost impacts related to COVID. Towable backlog for the quarter increased approximately 87% in units over the prior year period, reflecting a strong rebound in dealer demand in May, since April was the period most impacted by COVID, driven by strong retail sales recovery in May. In recent quarters, our multi-branded portfolio has proven to be resilient and successful in gaining towable share regardless of market conditions. While there is clearly uncertainty regarding near-term industry and consumer dynamics, we are confident in our long-term prospects to grow the business and to increase share. Demand for our towables lineup remains strong, 
and reflects the continued appeal of our brands with consumers. Now let us turn to the motorhome segment. With our refreshed lineup of high quality motorized RVs and the addition of Newmar's premium brand to our portfolio, we are positioned to more effectively compete in the high-end motorhome market and our motorhome segment is more balanced and competitive than ever. The acquisition of Newmar has already resulted in gains towards restoring our motorhome business to a leadership position by adding its highly respected luxury brand to our portfolio. Despite challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, the integration of Newmar into the Winnebago Industries portfolio is proceeding as planned. The company remains focused on ensuring that Newmar further expands its industry-leading position in the high-end motorhome market. In terms of segment results, third quarter motorhome segment revenues were up approximately 27% from the prior year period. Excluding Newmar, organic revenues decreased approximately 28%, again due to the COVID-19 related impacts we have discussed. Adjusted EBITDA margin decreased to negative 5.3% in the quarter, largely due to deleverage and cost impacts related to COVID, partially offset by the addition of Numar and the mix in the Winnebago branded portfolio driven by strength in our Class B motorhomes. Our motorhome backlog increased approximately 99% in units from the prior year due to the addition of Numar, but also a strong rebound in dealer demand in May. Since April was the period most impacted by COVID, driven by strong retail sales in May. The COVID impact to our business was material. It posed a threat to our employees' health, it forced us to suspend operations, and it demanded that we take swift action to preserve our liquidity. During this time, we also took a hard look at our fixed cost structure in the Winnebago branded motorhome business. The result of this review led to an eventual severance in other words, permanent removal of some Winnebago motorhome personnel. The $1.4 million restructuring charge is noted in our EBITDA to adjusted EBITDA reconciliation. As many of you may recall, we announced the closure of our Junction City manufacturing facility at around this time last year. That decision was made in the interest of cost savings to help improve the overall profitability of the motorhome segment. Ongoing annual savings of $4 million are expected starting in fiscal year 2021. Our new diesel line in Forest City, Iowa is nearly complete with new production planned for first quarter of our upcoming fiscal year 2021. Several weeks ago, we made the decision to complete the process and close the Junction City factory service operation. We have worked with dealers in the Pacific Northwest region to take in and customers who would have otherwise used our service facility in Oregon and provide them an alternate high quality experience. While these decisions are always hard, we believe we continue to make the right decisions in the long-term interest and health of our motorhome segment. With that overview, I will now turn the call over to our Chief Financial Officer, Brian Hughes, to review our fiscal 2020 third quarter financials in more detail. Brian? Thanks, Mike, and good morning, everyone. As Mike mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic and the related shutdown of our operations in the quarter, combined with the disruption to consumer purchasing patterns, all weighed heavily on our third quarter results for fiscal 2020. I'll repeat a few of the key financial metrics that Mike already cited earlier. Consolidated revenues in the third quarter were 402.5 million, a decrease of 23.9%, compared to $528.9 million for the fiscal 2019 period. Excluding Numar, we saw top-line organic revenues decline 40.5% versus the same period last year. Gross profit was $32 million, down from $86.6 million in the fiscal 2019 period. Gross profit margin decreased 840 basis points in the quarter due to deleverage and mix as the more profitable towable segment slowed more than the motorhome business did, also impacted by the mix shift from the Newmar acquisition. SG&A included amortization for Newmar of 4.7 million in the quarter. The amortization related to Newmar in Q4 
will be approximately 1.4 million. We have historically discussed in public forums the variable nature of our cost structure, estimating that it was approximately 85% variable, 15% fixed. The highly variable nature of our cost structure was substantiated in the range of 85% through our third quarter results. We were also able to favorably impact our fixed costs through certain cost containment measures. The operating income line showed a loss of 8.2 million for the third quarter, compared to operating income of 49 million in the third quarter of 2019. We had a net loss of 12.4 million in third quarter, compared to net income of 36.2 million in the third quarter of last year. Reported net loss per diluted share was 37 cents, compared to reported earnings per diluted share of $1.14 in the same period last year. We have provided adjusted EPS performance as a comparable metric to clearly illustrate our performance. Adjusted net loss per diluted share was $0.26 cents in the third quarter, compared to adjusted earnings per share of $1.14 in the same period last year excluding approximately 3.3 million or 10 cents per share of non-cash interest, 1.4 million or 4 cents per share of restructuring costs, and a favorable 200,000 or 1 cent per share true up of Numar related acquisition costs. These adjustments when netted for the respective tax impacts total an 11 cent difference between our reported diluted EPS and our adjusted diluted EPS. Consolidated adjusted EBITDA was 4.1 million for the quarter, compared to 55.9 million last year, a decrease of 92.7%. Now turning to the individual segments, starting with the total segment, revenues for the third quarter were 188.9 million, down from 346.8 million in fiscal 2019 primarily driven by the suspension of manufacturing and the disruption to consumer buying patterns due to COVID-19. Our towable lineup's resilience and popularity with consumers, in particular Grand Design, has again enabled the brand to gain market share despite COVID-19 related impacts to consumer buying behavior. Winnebago Industries unit share of the North American towable market on a trailing three month basis through April 2020 excluding folding and truck campers, was 10.7%, an increase of 2.0 share points over the same period in 2019. Segment adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter was 16.5 million, down 71.2% from 57.2 million in the prior year. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 8.7% in the quarter, driven lower versus the prior year period of 16.5% by deleverage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Turning to the motorhome segment, our motorhome revenues were 203.6 million for the quarter, up 43.4 million or 27.1% over the same period last year. Excluding Newmar, motorhome revenues were 115.6 million during the third quarter, driven by market share gains from the Revel, Travato, Bolt, and the recently introduced Solus brand in our market-leading Class B lineup. But this was more than offset by the volume impact of COVID-19. Segment adjusted EBITDA was a loss of 10.8 million for the third quarter, down from 0.4 million in fiscal 2019. Adjusted EBITDA margin was negative 5.3%, primarily driven by deleverage and cost impacts related to COVID-19, partially offset by the addition of Numar and Mix in the Winnebago branded portfolio driven by strength in our Class B motorhomes. Turning to our balance sheet, as of the end of the third quarter, the company had outstanding debt of 465 million, net of the convertible note discount of 77.6 million and debt issuance costs of 10.9 million. Working capital was $299.8 million. 
Our current net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio was 2.5 times, higher than our previous quarter end, and higher than our targeted range of 0.9 times to 1.5 times. This ratio was impacted by the lower adjusted EBITDA results this quarter that were driven by the unprecedented series of events related to the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, cash flow from operations was $162.4 million for the nine months of fiscal 2020, an increase of $79.6 million over the same period in fiscal 2019, driven by favorable changes in working capital. Our disciplined approach to preserving cash during this period was critical. Taking advantage of our highly variable cost structure, implementing other cost containment measures, and eliminating discretionary spending was all highly effective. As Mike mentioned, cash on hand at the end of the quarter rose to 152.5 million, which was 30 million, or 24.4% higher than the pre-COVID February balance of 122 million. We think the positive evolution of our cash balance during third quarter to be a good demonstration of the resilience of our business model and speaks well of our team's ability to react in the face of a crisis. The effective income tax rate for the third quarter was 25.3% compared to 19.4% for the same period in fiscal 2019. The increase was primarily due to a pre-tax loss in the current quarter and the favorable impact in the prior year of R&D tax credits. We expect our annual effective tax rate to be approximately 19% under, under the current tax code and before consideration of any discrete tax items that could occur in Q4. On May 19, 2020, our Board of Directors approved a quarterly cash dividend of $0.11 cents per share, payable on July 1, 2020, to common stockholders of record at the close of business on June 17, 2020. Before I turn the call back over to Mike, I want to reiterate our commitment to ensuring that we maintain sufficient liquidity going forward. As mentioned, we ended the third quarter with approximately $153 million of cash, and we have access to a $193 million ADL that remains untapped. We are confident that the combination of our cash position and our ABL will provide Winnebago Industries with sufficient liquidity to allow us to navigate our go-forward obligations. We also work with our strategic banking partners on an ongoing basis to evaluate our current debt portfolio and determine alternatives to optimize our capital structure. That concludes my review of our quarterly financials. And with that, I will now turn the call back to Mike to provide some closing comments. Mike? Thanks, Brian. I would like to conclude our comments this morning with our views of the health of the broader outdoor and specifically RV market, some thoughts on the company's financial outlook for the balance of the fiscal year, and a comment on an area Winnebago Industries is committed to improving in. Despite our third quarter financial results being significantly impacted by COVID-19, we were pleased with the relative performance of our diverse and balanced portfolio during this unprecedented market cycle. We learned a great deal in this short period, and it has served as a catalyst to reinforce the strengths of our business model in terms of our manufacturing processes, supply chain relationships, variable cost model, dealer partnerships, and especially the resilience of our premium brands. We have much work to do to continue to realize our organic potential, competitively, financially, and culturally. But we have designed a solid foundation from which to develop a stronger future. Now, it is no surprise to any of you on the call, but all recent and current indicators signal a very strong recovery for outdoor recreation product demand is in process this summer. From camping and RVs to fishing and boats, consumer interest in the outdoors and investments in these discretionary durable goods products have been robust. There have been much discussion about the influx of new consumers to these outdoor spaces, both in terms of purchases but also in the more experiential rental and sharing sides of the outdoor business. 
As the states continue to carefully manage the openness of their communities and activities, Americans are voting with their wallet and time that the outdoors is the place to be. Extraordinary and safe experiences with select family and friends in the outdoors. These are positive developments for our industries in the short term and as importantly set the stage for possible continued healthy market conditions for our products in 2021 as well. Today's customers are tomorrow's advocates. During the month of May, RV retail results turned positive year over year for our company. And that momentum has only continued to sequentially increase into June, as has our backlog position. While travel trailers in the towable segment and Class Bs in the motorhome segment have certainly led the way, we are also seeing our other product categories grow in the right direction as well. Our luxury brands, Numar and Chriscraft, have seen some of their strongest retail and order weeks in memory occur in recent times. This is not only a first-time buyer and value buyer market at present. We are seeing aspirational and step-up buying occur as well. All our businesses are scrutinizing their robust backlogs, production plans, lead times for delivery, and adjusting rates and schedules as necessary to safely meet demand in the future. There is no one answer as to what our production rates are or will be in the future as they continue to be very dynamic and disciplined relative to what's happening in the market. The outlook for the RV industry certainly has been volatile these past several months. The next several months will witness OEMs and suppliers trying to keep pace with dealer demand as a result of consumers flocking to the RV space and dealers trying to shore up low inventory levels. Dealer inventories were further improved by the OEM shutdown period in April and have continued to stay low as retail trends have in some markets overwhelmed lot inventory at some retailers. We are not seeing signs of dealers looking to abnormally increase their inventory levels above and beyond current retail trends. We anticipate that the industry should see collective positive retail trends for most of the remainder of calendar year 2020, with wholesale shipments trending slightly above retail in the summer and early fall period as dealers work to elevate inventories a bit. The weight of this trend will favor the towable segment versus the broader motorhome segment, but there should be winners in both categories. We believe that our brands and Winnebago Industries can collectively continue to take market share. However, we cannot comment at this time on what a reasonable overperformance number or range might be given the volatility of the market. And we see no systemic reason that our business within our business that says profitability will not return to where we wanted it to be pre-COVID-19. It will take time, but it can and it will return to those levels if we see stable, healthy market conditions in the quarters ahead. We do recognize that the challenges the country is facing related to coronavirus are still driving a degree of uncertainty around an economic recovery. Many of you are aware of the increasing number of daily cases occurring in many states around the U.S. Please know and understand that any unforeseen economic impact would most definitely change the perspectives I just shared, such as a second wave of COVID that may have an impact like what we saw before. We are especially focused within our workplace on how to identify possible COVID cases or exposure to COVID cases as quickly as possible. And we execute appropriate contact tracing and quarantining if necessary to mitigate the possibility of an outbreak in our facilities and keep our team safe. And we know that the variable cost management playbook that Brian described can be turned to again by our businesses if necessary. In closing on our business, we remain focused on safely returning to full operations across all of our campuses. In doing so, the health and safety of Winnebago Industries employees and our business partners will remain a top priority for our management team. We are committed to being decisive in taking 
the necessary actions to protect our employees. Our commitment to our core strategic enterprise priorities remains intact, and we are focused on ensuring we continue to provide innovative and high-quality products to our channel partners across all our brands. We are proactively taking steps to adapt to this evolving situation and are looking to not only survive the current environment, but to thrive in what is, for all of us, a new normal going forward. As mentioned earlier, this new normal will require us to be diligent in how we manage our expense structure and our ongoing liquidity. Our disciplined approach to managing our manufacturing production rates to retail demand, maintaining a highly variable cost structure, and evolving and strengthening our balance sheet is a strength and positions us well to create shareholder value as we come to the end of fiscal 2020 and move into 2021. One last overall comment. As many of you know, we have a small office in the Twin Cities area of Minneapolis and St. Paul. This region has garnered much attention this summer with the senseless and tragic death of George Floyd in our community. And while less than 2% of our total Winnebago Industries employees live and work in the Twin Cities area, the systemic issue of racial injustice and discrimination is present across all the geographic communities our company has a presence in and is relevant to all Americans. It is unacceptable, and we together as citizens and neighbors must make positive, peaceful change in the right direction. We are extremely proud of the progress we have made at Winnebago Industries to improve our business from a strategic and financial perspective. I firmly believe we are better in many dimensions than we have ever been. We are attracting more consumers than ever to our brands, and that end customer base is becoming increasingly diverse. The outdoors is appealing to people of various backgrounds, and it must appeal to people of various backgrounds going forward. But this alone is not enough. In early June, our leadership issued statements to our employees and publicly on our corporate website that essentially said we can and we must do better. Leadership, and especially me, need to do a much better job as business leaders and community members in accelerating an improved culture of diversity and inclusion within our company. Our progress in this arena has not been strong enough yet amidst all of our other priorities. Our employees are talented and engaged, caring and determined, but we can and will improve in how our leadership team and all our value teammates across the enterprise better reflect our evolving customer base, how we ensure a work environment which provides equitable opportunities to all employees to reach their potential, and we provide a healthy environment for the unique opinions and backgrounds for those that are present on our team. We look forward to humbly listening and learning to partnering and planning, and putting words into action in the future in our company. My hope is that our peers in the outdoor industry will commit with us at Winnebago Industries to do the same, doing better and together elevating our industries, but importantly, strengthening our unity in the communities. There is much work to do but I would be remiss in not mentioning this critical subject this morning as an imperative now going forward. Thanks very much for your time, and thanks again to the Winnebago Industries team for their tremendous work. I will now turn the line back over to the operator to take questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star than one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Our first question comes from the line of Craig Kennison with Baird. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks for taking my questions. I uh, wanted to ask, Mike, if you could put a numerical estimate on 
uh, retail growth in May and June for either Winnebago or the industry? Yeah, good morning, Craig. Um, you know, I am a bit nervous in giving you that numerical estimate because of how dynamic things continue to be and some of the uncertainty about what the future could be. Um, I, can, I can share with you and everyone else on the call this, though, that, um, you know, our April retail uh, drop was relatively similar to the rest of the industry. Uh, in fact, there wasn't a, as huge a gap in performance as we've seen in past months within our, our, our company, and, and that to us essentially indicated that because especially of the disruption to businesses uh, and consumers with stay-at-home orders, um, that the, the drop in retail was pretty equitable across the industry. However, we did see beginning in late April, and especially the first week of May, a significant and steady recovery sequentially throughout that month and it continues into the month of June. And as I mentioned early in my comments this morning, we just received retail for um, you know, week ending this last Saturday or Sunday, and it was our highest comp um, year over year that we've seen in the recovery. Um, I would share with you this, that um, I think the industry uh, has a chance in the month of May to um, be around even, um, in retail performance, we'll see what the SSI reports say when they come out. Um, and in the month of June, I believe that retail performance for the industry will be solidly in the up double-digit range. Um, I don't want to comment much further, probably past you know June or July. Um, as I also commented, I do believe that the retail momentum can sustain itself through the summer and I'm hopeful that the retail momentum can positively comp through the rest of the calendar year. I think we're all a bit nervous about potentially the fall and winter as it pertains to uh, the impacts of a ongoing uh, evolution of the, of the, the virus and, and maybe flu conditions as well. Um, we do believe that wholesale shipments will, um, in, over a period of time, exceed retail um, as dealers begin to uh, stock inventory uh, at a little bit higher level, as, as OEMs catch up to the retail demand as well. So, um, but I, we're, we're a little leery right now, Craig, to give you an estimate um, numerically on what the future will be. Um, but I do believe June, uh, as an example, will be up double digits for the industry in retail. And I believe Winnebago Industries' performance will continue to show um, a, a market share advantage uh, when those numbers are reported in the future. Thank you. And then as a follow-up, maybe I'm sure you're seeing an influx of, of first-time buyers. I'm wondering if you can quantify uh, the mix of first-time buyers, and then specifically what uh, Winnebago can do to convert those people who seem to be testing this industry as a lifestyle and convert them into permanent uh, long-term customers. Yeah, the topic of uh, first-time buyers has certainly been one that has been visible within the industry and in the media, and, uh, and, and we do believe it's a real phenomenon. Uh, we do not... Um, track that uh, specifically on our retail registration cards. Uh, this has probably challenged us that uh, we can do a better job in that area. Um, our feedback on uh, new first-time buyers uh, in, in the industry is mostly anecdotal as we talk to our, um, as we talk to our dealers around the country. And as you can imagine, um, they have a good idea of that, uh, and it especially presents itself uh, when a consumer doesn't come in talking about uh, trading in a unit or trading up uh, from a unit. Um, we have a, a broad lineup, as you all know. Uh, we sell everything from $20,000 travel trailers to, you know, $1.2 million, you know, luxury RVs and, you know, three-quarter million dollar boats. And so the, the percentage of first-time buyers varies by product segment within our business. Um, but on average, we believed in past years that that has tended to run around 30 to 35 percent uh, of, uh, of the buyers in the past several years have been first-time buyers. 
We believe in several categories, uh, especially on the, in the towable segment, uh, that that number has increased materially, potentially closer you know, to 45 or 50 percent, and maybe even higher in some of the lower price point categories. It's not that high, though, on some of the uh, higher priced uh, or potentially motorhome categories. So again, the number for us is, is a blend of different uh, factors, but I definitely believe that it is trending higher. We believe that's a good thing in the short term, certainly, with the retail demand we're seeing, but we, uh, and I'll answer your second question here, we believe that can be a very positive thing in the future as well if we can get these consumers to stick in the, the RVing or the boating lifestyle. Uh, the best thing that Winnebago Industries can do uh, to ensure that the consumers uh, stay in the, the lifestyle is to build a high-quality product. Um, and we believe that's one of our differentiating uh, elements of our business model versus um, most of our competition. We certainly fall down at times, uh, but we believe a high majority of the time we produce a quality product that uh, our our customers can count on. The second thing we can do is work very carefully with our dealers and closely with our dealers to ensure that the service experience when something does go wrong uh, is a satisfactory one for that end consumer. And that ranges you know, in, from everything from uh, technician training uh, to available documentation on uh, you know, the components within our products to especially delivering parts in a timely manner to our dealers. Um, so I believe if we build a high quality product, which I believe our brands do, and we can partner with our dealers to offer an acceptable uh, service experience uh, that we'll continue to see a majority of those consumers like we have in the last decade uh, stay in the lifestyle. Great, thanks Mike. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Scott Simber with CL King. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks, guys, for taking my questions. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Scott. Um, maybe we could talk about the core Winnebago motorized product, you know, A's uh, and C's. Um, you talked about it. You alluded to the fact that to the to, to the fact that it seems less that part of the business is also recovering right now. Maybe just talk about, you know, again, how C's are doing in recent weeks and gas A's and traditional Winnebago uh, diesel. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, Scott, I, I do want to address class C's. If, if you look at the, uh, you know, the supplemental information with our release this morning, you will see in the motorized segment a a, a significant drop on Class C's, and I want to point out that, um, you know, certainly the volume this year is not only impacted by, you know, uh, what, what transpired in the quarter relative to COVID-19, uh, but we also saw a pretty significant shift in rental order disruption uh, in the quarter as well. The majority of our class of our rental business historically has been Class C business, um, and that was disrupted pretty significantly in this quarter. In fact, we had several rental players who uh, canceled or pushed out some orders there. Uh, now, as I look at recent uh, Class C retail uh, for the Winnebago brand, uh, the, numbers are, the numbers are significantly better at retail than what you see in the report that we released today for uh, the third quarter. Um, our retail increases, uh, you know, in the month of May, uh, late May and into June on Class C's are solidly favorable by double-digit percentages uh, at retail, positive lines. Um, so that, that category um, is certainly healthy, we believe, in the market currently, and we believe that our shipments um, will recover uh, from the, the low level that uh, we experienced uh, in the third quarter. Um, we also have uh, the introduction of several Super C models from our new Numar business uh, that are happening as we speak as well, and we are beginning to retail uh, those uh, in the marketplace as well here in the last 30 to 45 days. The motorhome business has definitely been slower in recovering at retail 
than towables here in the last you know, six to seven weeks. Uh, however, it is beginning to recover very nicely. And I'll just share this data point that uh, the Newmar business had perhaps one of its highest single weeks of retail in recent memory, a long time, here just recently, um, you know, earlier this month. Um, our Chris Craft business, just to give you an idea as to the sort of the luxury brands rebounding, our Chris Craft uh, May retail was the highest it's been since we've owned Chris Craft in a single month, and it was higher than any other month that they're aware of here in the last five years. So while the recovery started with those value products and those opening price point products, uh, we are beginning to see um, consumers across the spectrum uh, begin, to, begin to step up. Um, I think the health of the stock market and the equities market, Scott, has been quite helpful with the Class A segment and some of the recovery we're now starting to see there. I think uh, people with balances, certainly retirement portfolios, investment portfolios, are more comfortable with the status of the market and willing to make investments now in some of those high-end motorhome or boat segments, uh, given increased confidence uh, in how the market is performing. Got it. And uh, when factoring in some of the restructuring uh, that you guys alluded to earlier, maybe talk about where do you see motorhome profit going? Um, you know, going forward. Um, are there any incremental savings from some of these? Uh, these maneuvers that we should look out for? Well, we've highlighted and mentioned again today the, the savings you'll see from the decision uh, on Junction City. Um, and I also commented generally that we don't see anything systemically within our business that says we can't return to the profitability levels that we had projected going into the pandemic. Um, as you all know, we've been working on motorhome segment competitiveness and profitability for some time and we continue to make the moves that we think are right for that business. That includes um, increasing the percentage of variable cost in that business versus fixed, which means we've been addressing the fixed element of the business. And very candidly, as I also indicated, we are also scrutinizing uh, the amount of labor we need in that business as our manufacturing uh, continuous improvement initiatives have taken hold and productivity increases. We have strong goals for profitability to improve in the Winnebago branded motorhome segment. And if you'll recall, the Newmar business brings accretive profitability in the motorhome segment. And once again, we get back to some semblance of, of uh, stability and normalcy uh, there as well, we, we, we think you'll continue to see the profitability of that segment uh, improve. Um, could it ever reach the level of tollables uh, segment? That's probably a more difficult challenge, uh, but Scott, we see no reason why we can't, again, as things start to stabilize here, we don't see any reason why we can't get back to continuing to improve the profitability of our motorhome segment. Scott, and just one last quick question, new product development for 2000, or product in introductions for 2021, how will that be done this year? Will there be an open house? I know discussions are ongoing within the industry uh, about uh, the open house event uh, in September in uh, Elkhart, uh, and I don't think anything has uh, been completely finalized or firmed up, but uh, I would imagine a communication around that topic, topic will be forthcoming here in, in future weeks. Um, we are evaluating, obviously, our presence in all retail or trade shows this summer and fall to make sure that our employees who represent our brands and certainly our dealers and our end consumers uh, can be safe in those environments. Um, we have not taken our foot off the pedal on new product development at Winnebago Industries in the last 100 days. Uh, that was one of the decisions we made very early on with our business unit leaders was that we'll do everything we can, obviously, to manage the business financially in a, uh, an exhaustive manner um, but that we wanted to stay aggressive on the product development side. Um, so we are not uh, seeing delays in new product introductions uh, in the coming uh, months or you know, the next fiscal year or two uh, as a result of the pandemic. 
Um, if anything, I would tell you in conversations I've had with a few of our business leaders in, in the last uh, week, um, I think the creative juices are flowing about how we can, um, you know, how we can design some new products that take advantage of, uh, you know, the new consumers coming into the outdoor space um, and what those consumers are generally looking for. So, so we continue to be optimistic about uh, our ability to bring, um, you know, high value, innovative products to the market. Got it. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Steve O'Hara with Fidoti and Company. Your line is now open. Hi. Thanks for taking the question. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Uh, just, I, I was curious about, uh, you know, Class B. I mean, obviously that was uh, pretty strong in the quarter uh, in terms of units. Uh, I mean, is there? I guess I can understand why, you know, Class A would be up with Newmar coming in. Um, you explain Class C, but Class B seemed very strong, you know, relative to, you know, even Tollable. Um, and I mean, I know that's been a, you know, uh, a standout for you guys. But was there something else going on in the quarter that, you know, kind of led you or, you know, made you able to, uh, you know, keep producing where you couldn't in others? Or uh, can you just tell me what happened there? Thank you. Yeah, Steve, thank you uh, for the question and good morning. Um, if you recall, there's probably two factors at play here. Um, and, and to be transparent on one of them, you know, if you recall, and I'm sure many do um, on the line today, um, we had been experiencing some significant chassis availability issues, you know, a year ago and for, you know, periods or, you know, uh, even leading up to that. Um, and uh, those that those availability issues a year ago are probably in part embedded uh, in the numbers that you see in the release, uh, you know, for third quarter last year. Um, we have been seeing uh, better uh, chassis availability in Class B as we began the calendar year 2020. Um, and in our third quarter of fiscal 2020, um, we had the ability to make product and retail demand um, was significant, especially in the or wholesale demand was significant, especially in the months of, of March and May uh, when we were shipping product. Um, we believe that the majority of the uh, the increase, though, is driven by the competitiveness of the line. You know, we have some great products in the the Travato, uh, the Rebel, uh, the introduction of our new pop top camper van, uh, the Solus. Uh, has been a hit. Um, I, the van I drove to Indiana uh, was the Bolt. Uh, that was a, a great experience. Uh, so we continue to uh, execute well with our dealers on a, on a line of, of vans that uh, you know resonate very well with consumers. And uh, we know that this is becoming a more crowded segment, um, and others in the industry certainly have aspirations to compete well in this arena. Uh, but our team is very focused, and I can only tell you that there are, uh, you know, significant new products in the pipeline, you know, that uh, are coming to, um, you know, attempt to sustain our, our level of competitiveness going forward. Okay. Um, and then uh, maybe last one, if I could squeeze one more in. Uh, in terms of the outbreak um, and your, you know, restarting of facilities, uh, things like that, um, can you just talk about whether you've had outbreaks uh, at facilities um, and then, you know, how long does it take to kind of, um, you know, get operations back up to the new normal once again if, if you have an outbreak in a facility? Um, and, you know, this, you know, obviously you got to start up again slowly, I would think. And, and how long you think about that process maybe going forward? I think it's something that's probably going to be with us a long time uh, or at least, you know, for the next six months, let's say at least. Um, and, and the costs surrounding that, um, you know. Obviously, there's a human cost, but I guess maybe just on the business cost. Thank you. Yeah, I'll talk about uh, the process of keeping our employees safe and then ask Brian to comment on any of the costs relative to COVID-19 that we've been seeing in the business. But, uh, Steve, I want to thank you for the question because uh, I want to reiterate to everyone that this is the most important topic in our business right now. Um, I know many of you will, will certainly want to know if we can um, you know, meet the demand um, and, and capture, you know, maximum revenue. Um, but our number one uh, imperative here at the company right now is making sure that our employees are safe, and it has to be going forward. And so it does affect everything we're doing right now. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We've had some tremendous leaders um, 
of different work streams within the company uh, who have uh, been guiding uh, us through the protocols necessary to keep our, our employees safe. Um, we have more than 4,000 manufacturing employees. Um, our office environment is, uh, and, and by the way, most of those 4,000 manufacturing employees are, are coming to work every day trying to help us meet that demand. Um, our office employees um, are less consistently in the office because many of them can do their work from home and we continue to embrace allowing them to do that. Um, but every day is a battle in the plants to make sure that we adhere to the protocols and we, uh, we, have, we have done a myriad of things. Obviously PPE is in place uh, that our employees are required to wear in, in the manufacturing environment uh, or in common spaces in the office. Um, we obviously are asking our employees to be incredibly honest with us about uh, how, how they're feeling, how their health has been, who they've been exposed to. Uh, temperature checks are required you know, in all uh, parts of our business. Uh, work has been redesigned, uh, workstations uh, to create more social distancing, uh, to reduce the amount of time that people are spending potentially in close proximity to their teammates. In many areas, uh, we are tracking um, people's movements uh, to ensure that we know who they are in touch with. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a way that invades privacy, but we want to know who our employees are in close contact with uh, in the work environment so that if a case develops, uh, that we can uh, make sure that we understand who might have been exposed. I'm happy to report that the number of cases at Winnebago Industries um, relative to our employees, but relative to what we're seeing in the geographic areas that we have a presence in, uh, tends to be running um, you know, much better than what the local communities have been seeing. And the answer to your question is no. We have not seen any outbreaks uh, in a particular area of the company that has caused us to shut that area or department down for an extended period of time. If we do have someone who tests positive for COVID, um, or we suspect, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe at risk of having the virus, uh, there are significant protocols for sanitization and cleaning in the area that that employee uh, was at. But um, as you can imagine, um, you know, uh, this is this is an ongoing challenge. Uh, we actually feel that in most cases, our employees are safer in the work environment than they might be at home or in the community uh, where sometimes, uh, you know, the adherence to protocols in public are not as consistently executed. So ongoing battle. Uh, I think our team is doing a good job. And, um, and I'll have Brian comment on some of the costs that are related to, you know, to COVID. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, one other comment on, uh, you know, the risk that's uh, presented to us on a daily basis. You got to recall, and many of you are aware of this, but on each of our campuses, we have separate and distinct facilities. You know, so we're further dispersed, even within a campus, um, and and that also um, helps to mitigate that risk of a uh, the contagion. Um, and so, uh, just uh, one other comment there, as it relates to the cost ongoing. Um, you know, it's really limited going forward here to the PPE or, or the the um, protective equipment that we're issuing to employees, which is uh, is pretty de minimis. Um, the workflow itself that Mike referenced has not um, reduced our productivity or, in a, in said another way, our number of units produced per day. You know, so we have not introduced inefficiencies in that regard either. And so when I look at the uh, the all-in costs um, go forward, it's it's really pretty immaterial, uh, Steve, and I don't expect a, a margin impact, a notable margin impact um, as a result of costs that we've introduced to help keep our people safe. Okay, all right, thanks, that's, uh, that's a very good call, I appreciate it. Thank you, our next question comes from the line of Mike Swartz with SunTrust. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, Mike, just wanted to start with some comments that you made earlier, just maybe a little clarification on how you're thinking about retail for the remainder of the calendar year or, or the calendar year in total. I'm, I'm uh, just trying to understand that when you said positive, were you talking about for the remainder of the calendar year or are you saying for the 
uh, calendar year in its entirety? And was that an industry number or a Winnebago number that you were discussing? Yeah, I, I am hopeful that uh, industry retail for the remainder of our fiscal year and for the remainder of the calendar year uh, will be positive. I'd have to go back with Steve here and do the math on the whole of those periods, but um, I believe that the industry retail for the remainder of our fiscal year and the calendar year 2020 uh, should be positive. Um, and as I mentioned in my uh, answer uh, to, to Craig's question, uh, you know, in the short term here, we are seeing, um, you know, retail running at a, you know, a significantly double-digit, you know, higher level in the in this year's period than uh, a year ago. Um, and so, uh, I also indicated that I believe Winnebago Industries can continue to compete effectively, and hopefully gain share in those two periods as well: the rest of our fiscal year and the rest of our calendar year. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation with analysts or other stakeholders as to whether um, there will be pressure on Winnebago's market share performance given uh, we have less of a presence in the opening uh, price point segments, the, the, the travel trailer segments especially, um, and we'll see how that, how that turns out. But we also have some areas where, like Class Bs and some others, where you know, we think uh, fifth wheels, we, we have been outperforming. So we'll see what the net is uh, going forward. So uh, Mike, I hope that's, that's helpful. I, as I indicated earlier, I'm a little leery to sit here today and tell you exactly, you know, uh, we're running a variety of models, you know, high, medium, low here in our company. I know RVIA has, has started to go that direction as well with their models. Um, uh, we, with every week that passes that we continue to see great retail demand, um, I become more optimistic that that, that environment can be sustained for a longer period uh, going forward. But I think it's premature for us to comment on what 2021 will look like when there are still some pretty significant macroeconomic challenges ahead of this country uh, in, I think, the calendar third and fourth quarters. Um, and uh, this health crisis has not completely played itself out yet as well. So, um, But our backlogs would certainly indicate increased confidence from dealers that the future market environment is going to be strong. That, that, that's helpful. And then perfect segue. This, the, the other question I had, just clarification, was that you made the comment your backlog was higher at current than what we saw in the end of May. Um, uh, any, any quantification or, or from a relative standpoint, what, what that looks like today? Um, more, higher. <laughs> Um, no, I, we won't share a specific number, but um, it's, it's been like retail. It's just continued to increase with every week as the dealers continue to try to place products. And I know many of you are probably wondering how our lead times are to our, to our dealers. They vary by category, um, but we, we are now seeing, you know, uh, the lead times to meet some of the, you know, the latest orders in the backlog um, you know, those are, those are pretty extended now, you know, into, in some cases, on some products, the three- or four-month range. Um, so, you know, all of the OEMs working with our suppliers are trying to carefully, certainly ramp up safely, uh, you know, production rates where appropriate. It does vary by product segment and line across the company. Um, and um, I will give our suppliers a lot of credit that they continue to do a very good job in, in giving us timely deliveries on most of our components. Uh, we continue to see hiccups here or there, um, but you know everybody is trying to work safely and, and in the RV and boat industry meet this rising tide. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brad Andres with KeyBank Capital. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning. Um, Mike, Sorry, just bro. a question on the sustainability of this demand that you mentioned earlier. So I think many of us have compared the demand to the multi-year growth that happened um, around the September 2001 timeframe and all the airlines, you know, disruption that that caused. So I guess, do you think that using history in that context is a fair analog for thinking about demand sustainability here? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Brett. Good morning. Um, I certainly wasn't in the, the RV industry during the time period that you referenced. Um, I know some people that, that were, and, and uh, they educate me frequently on, on some of that history. Um, I do believe there are some really positive dynamics that lead to a probability for sustainment going forward. Um, some of them are unique to this time, and you referenced, you know, one of them in the sense of, um, you know, uh, people getting on airplanes, uh, cruise ships, uh, staying in hotels. The interest from the con from the end the consumer is is definitely lower than it has been potentially since, uh, unfortunately, 9/11. Um, but even in today's environment, it's different, you know, than 9/11. And while we're starting to see some appetite for traveling in those ways come back slowly, um, you know, many surveys and studies in the last 30 to 45 days have shown that camping, uh, fishing, RVing, boating are definitely being preferred as uh, this year's flavor and maybe next year's flavor uh, for the way a family and individuals will spend their discretionary uh, time. Um, interest rates, uh, fuel prices, um, you know, again, the stability, it seems, uh, that has returned to the stock market. Uh, there's a lot of really positive signs from an economic indicator standpoint. Truck sales are recovering. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, that all seems to bode well. Um, that being said, as I continue to mention, uncertainty around the health crisis and some of the other shoes that may be yet to fall in terms of uh, the American economy, um, you know, remain potentially in front of us. But yes, as I just said, I'm, I'm increasingly optimistic that uh, this recovery has, has legs. And the other thing that I, I know will be touched on with you all is the field inventory position in the dealer base is in really good position right now relative to what appears to be future retail demand. And obviously the industry worked on that during the back half of 2018 and 19 Going into calendar 2020, I think the industry was in a much better position field inventory-wise with the dealers. And when the OEM shut down for four to six weeks in April, and retail uh, kept going, albeit at a, at a much lower level during that time period, you saw another chunk of inventory get sucked out of the field. And so uh, with retail coming back faster, uh, dealers are clamoring for product, as they should be. And... Um, Long term, there's a chance for dealer inventories and turns, um, you know, to be at a at a level where um, some careful restocking of the dealer base will happen in addition to just meeting retail demand right now. So for all those reasons, I am optimistic about um, the RV industry and the boating industry here for for the foreseeable future. And these first time buyers could be a wave that sets the industry up for for good years going forward as well as, as they potentially step up. Um, I'm, Brian and I are cautiously um, monitoring uh, the macro, you know, and economic and health environment uh, to continually, continuously monitor if there are any disruptive trends uh, that could blow what I just set up. Uh, we hope that's not the case, but I think we have to be uh, honest that anything can happen considering what we went through in March and April. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Fred Whiteman with Wolf Research. Your line is now open. Hey, guys, good morning. Just on the supply chain side, uh, I, I think that, Mike, you had mentioned some delivery challenges and your prepared remarks, but it seems like the supply chain is holding up. Uh, and you had touched on sort of the Class B chassis situation, but can you just talk about overall chassis availability and sort of the broader motorized segment? Are you seeing any issues there with some of your suppliers? Yeah, I will confirm uh, your initial uh, part of your question, which uh, supply chain availability broadly uh, is hanging in there. Um, with, with all respect to the the people in the trenches at our company that that, that manage the production uh, you know process uh, and work with our suppliers on a daily basis, uh, there are, there are hiccups you know that we manage through and work through respectfully with our suppliers. But the supply chain, by and large, has done a, a good job helping us recover. The area that we have seen the most disruption in continues to be motorized chassis. 
Um, and it, it has varied from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, uh, the, the supplier that had given us uh, a lot of issues a year and a half ago um, on Class B vans um, has, has improved in their uh, availability uh, to our company. Um, we have seen, unfortunately, though, some other suppliers on motorized chassis um, have some challenges restarting their businesses, especially if they have operations in Mexico, <clears throat> either for parts or components for those chassis, uh, or if they're assembling those chassis in their entirety uh, in that region. And so, um, you know, the auto industry probably came out of the blocks a little bit slower than some of the other RV uh, suppliers. And for that reason, we've had some production disruptions uh, here in the last, uh, you know, three to four weeks relative to motorized chassis. But I don't view those as, um, again, systemic or things that will be you know, structurally uh, issues for a long period of time. I think they're, they're a transitional challenge as everybody's trying to uh, restart their business and, and uh, match production to what, you know, what they're seeing demand-wise in the market. Okay, great. That's, that's really helpful. And, and this is sort of a follow-up to a few other questions, but I'm going to ask it in a slightly different way. I mean, if we look at the positive retail commentary that you've given on today's call, a lot of first-time buyers entering the category, I mean, how should we be thinking about wholesale production for the industry relative to that prior peak in terms of just over 500,000 units? Are we talking about, you know, 5% above that, 10% above that? If we wanted to dream the dream, what could that look like, you think, for the overall industry? Yeah, no, I respect the question, you know, um, and I, I know we all remember the year that uh, the industry shipped over 500,000 units. Um, I'm not sure all of those 500,000 units were responsibly shipped to the market, um, but um, if we continue to see the RV lifestyle especially be in favor versus other means of travel or vacationing, um, and uh, I know what's been discussed in the last uh, month or two as well, this continued trend in, in work from anywhere, um, work from the road, using these products for multiple use cases, you can certainly make a you can certainly make a case that you're, you know, you could see a very healthy wholesale environment for the next several years. Um, I, we're not going to come anywhere close to 500,000 units for calendar year 2020 as an industry. Um, and, um, you know, but is there a possibility if uh, the health environment improves and, you know, the, the economic environment uh, continues to improve that the industry can return to those levels someday? Well, certainly that would be a hope, um, but I think our company is staying very focused on first and foremost safety, secondly product quality, uh, third matching product, uh, our production rates to demand, and, and trying to, um, you know, increase our output, um, you know, on the products that are moving in the market. So we're gonna we're not gonna take advantage of this opportunity to push products on dealers that they don't want. Uh, we're not going to make open production uh, with that doesn't have a name on it, um, you know, uh, and, and hope it sells. Uh, we are going to continue to stay disciplined. That may put our company at a slight disadvantage, you know, in this environment of losing some shipment share. Uh, but I believe over the long term, you know, we'll continue to perform well at retail, and and that pull environment will, you know, will lead us to the right number from a shipment standpoint. But in spirit, I agree with the optimism, uh, but I think it's going to—I think it's going to take a little while to get to uh, back to half a million units of RV shipped a year. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brett Jordan with Jeffries. Your line is not open. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning, Brett. Hey, a little bit, I guess, sort of more of a dive into the new consumer. And you look at the average new buyer and you sort of compare them to the legacy RV buyer. Is this a, a higher FICA score consumer or lower? Are these people who might have previously spent their vacation dollars doing something else and are now shifting to this lifestyle? Or are these people who are now maybe feeling liquid given stimulus checks and coming with, with money in their pocket from that source. Yeah, Brett, 
Thanks for the question. Um, I'm not sure we know enough about the first-time buyers to answer all of those questions that uh, that you listed there. Um, I, I, you know, my personal opinion is that they're they're trending to be a little bit younger. Uh, they're tending to be more family-oriented. Um, I don't think we're seeing people use government stimulus checks uh, to get into the lifestyle. Um, I think those checks for those um, folks that received them were used more pragmatically for current debt or current living expenses. Um, we have seen retail finance companies um, be extremely thorough uh, in uh, the credit worthiness of the consumers, uh, but yet we're seeing you know, significant retail happening, and so those retail finance entities are lending money uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to those people that are looking to buy. So, um, yeah, I, I just don't know if we know enough yet as to, you know, exactly the, the composition, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking a little bit younger, a little bit more family-oriented, um, and, and, and people that definitely have the ability to make a down payment or the credit nature to, to get into the, the industry. Brian, would you comment on any of the, the retail finance environment that you've been able to learn from our, our partners? Yeah, I, you know, that too is, is somewhat anecdotal, but what we're hearing is that the availability of credit is, is still certainly there. Uh, I'm not hearing of instances where um, people are being turned away from a retail sale because they couldn't get a uh, credit app finalized. Uh, but as you kind of alluded to, Mike, we are hearing, um, you know, expectations on slightly higher credit scores and then probably even more relevant, um, a longer process as uh, the, the providers of credit um, focus on validation of employment and, and ongoing um, financial stability of the applicants. So uh, those are really the anecdotal comments that we're hearing. Okay, and I guess the timing, you talked about your um, lead times in some categories getting extended sort of three, four months. At what point in the summer, I know it's pushing into July, so those would maybe be delivered early fall, um, do either the consumers or the dealers start to get concerned about either missing the use in 2020 or holding inventory from a dealer standpoint into the fall? Like when do we think, and maybe it's extended this time because it's such a shift in the cycle, but at what point do you think we're going to see a sort of a seasonal slowdown in that order book just given the the delivery time and, and the coming winter? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because um, I, many of us believe the timing of the the experiential season for camping and outdoor activities is going to be extended this year. Um, you know, in some parts of the country, it's a relatively short window. Um, you know, here in Minnesota, you got about 12 good weekends from, you know, end of May to the beginning of September to fit a lot of your outdoor activity in. Um, but I believe you're going to see across the country people spending more time outdoors for longer periods of time and later into the calendar year, and we are hopeful uh, that because of that you will, you will see consumers uh, be open about um, you know, being able to take product later in the calendar year than they generally have. So, so we'll see how that seasonality curve maybe adjusts out in calendar year 2020. Uh, because of what's happening, I believe it well materially. Uh, KOA did a study that they released in early May that, that hinted at that, I believe. Um, so, so we don't know yet. But um, when you start seeing lead times for products that are, you know, three, three to four months, you're, the dealers definitely uh, get anxious, um, as, as they should, um, because the consumers are anxious to hear those, you know, those lead times as well. So... So there'll be some natural tension with that that will probably govern a little bit of the, the retail growth. Uh, and I'm sure all companies like ours will you know, continue to try to find ways to safely um, lower those, those lead times uh, as we can. The more sustainable this is, um, you know, you'll certainly start to see OEMs consider um, you know, more uh, significant capital investments and in, in capacity adjustments uh, going forward. But, um, Again, we're hoping for a long outdoor season in 2020, and if we do not have an immunization drug uh, before we hit 2021, we're hopeful that uh, you know, we're hopeful that the outdoor season gets going early in calendar year 2021, and, and and lasts for a long time in that period as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Whiston with Morningstar. Your line is not open. Thanks. Good morning. Um, Mike, it, it sounds like you're um, maybe a bit more cautiously – have a bit more caution than your initial um, outlook for, on unit demand uh, for the rest of the year implied. Um, and unemployment, to me, I mean, at best-case scenario, probably goes down into the high single digits from here. And I, I guess I know you've got premium brands that can instantly do to a, to a point. But just, I mean, how sustainable is all this, given unemployment staying at, at that high? Eventually, it's got to impact consumer confidence, no? Yeah, I mean, again, that's that's the right question to ask, David, and good morning. Um, you know, we're monitoring that carefully. I, I think what will be important in determining the relevance of the unemployment level uh, to our business will be what that unemployment um, pool looks like uh, you know, um, and their affinity for, you know, our products. And um, certainly if you see unemployment settle in the high single digits, um, you know, to low double digits, um, that's not a good place to be in long term. And that's why we're just being very honest with everyone that we continue to monitor a metric like that and, and try to see, um, you know, what the long term impact of that uh, could be. Uh, but that being said, uh, there are less choices for people, whether they're employed or not, to spend their, their savings or, or their discretionary income, um, you know, to have great memories with families and friends, those that they feel comfortable hanging with. And I think our industries compete very well. Certainly, our brands are usually not always the first-time buyer's brands. Sometimes they are, um, but sometimes we earn the second, third, fourth, or fifth purchase, and we hope once they get into our brands uh, that, they're, that they're here to stay. So, um, you know, again, we, we believe that uh, the RV and boating industry has done a good job through the years of, um, especially the RV side, of keeping uh, enough value products in the product portfolio to attract buyers uh, that have the means to invest in the lifestyle, um, and then I think it's the discerning brand's opportunity to step them up, um, either on the retail lot um, or in or in future years. Um, so again, I, I think we're more bullish uh, than what the RVIA shipment forecast says. I don't think we're all that different from some of the rhetoric you've heard from some of the other peers in the RV industry or boating industry about the retail environment uh, in calendar year 2020. Um, I think wholesale shipments will be in part dictated by OEM's ability to keep up and uh, raise production rates safely. Um, we're just not ready to get too far ahead of ourselves with any thoughts on calendar year 2021 um, quite yet. Uh, we'll probably be more comfortable on our next earnings call with some thoughts there. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. And just one more question. Can you benefit more than you um, already are? or perhaps are not from the rental and sharing market, perhaps even to the point that you um, would want to invest in uh, a, a digital firm that's doing the sharing business or start your own? Yeah, as we, as we commented in our, in our prepared comments, that that sharing economy and that rental economy is experiencing all-time high interest right now. I, I'm sure many of us uh, you know, on or listening to this call have had friends or neighbors or family members that you know have – have looked at uh, some of those sharing platforms and or went to a dealer and, and rented an RV or, or have reservations in the, later in the summer to do so. Uh, so, yes, there's, there's high demand for that. We believe that that's a net positive, that anyone who gets exposed to our lifestyle uh, via an experience has a higher probability of being interested in investing in the lifestyle in a permanent way going forward. Used inventory is extremely low right now in the market. Uh, dealers, they want more used inventory. They can't get their hands on enough. When they have it, 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 it flies off the shelf. Um, I spoke with a boat dealer recently who had a used product where uh, he had three customers bidding for that used product, and he was able to sell that product at a higher level than what you know, kind of the used book value was. Um, we're not going to share any or, or offer any comments on what our, our business development plans would be in terms of 
um, you know, investing in platforms like that, but um, we do work carefully with some of those sharing platforms, and we certainly work carefully with our dealers uh, as to what their rental fleets could look like, um, you know, uh, here, uh, you know, going forward. So we, we anticipate that, that the whole industry will benefit from that. And again, we offer a, um, you know, a, a quality lineup of brands for, you know, those discerning uh, people in the lifestyle. And, um, you know, we, we, think, we think we can compete effectively for the part of the market that we want going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tim Condor with Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Thank you. And gentlemen, you've answered a lot of questions, provide a lot of detail. We greatly appreciate that. Um, a couple, though, I did want to follow up on. Um, back to the chassis. Uh, uh, specifically, when when do you think this will be resolved for yourselves, for the industry? Any any color you can ha uh, add there uh, to your previous comments, and then uh, the industry, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, um, again, it sounds like the industry continues to struggle to meet current demand. So, when one, do we think we get to that point? And then two, uh, it sounds like you're you're saying, please uh, uh, just uh, clarify if you could that it will be the fall before we can get to the point of rebuilding and restocking to the appropriate level uh, in the channel? Yeah, I, uh, let me start – good morning, Tim. Let me start with your motorized chassis question. Um, uh, I, I think uh, many of those issues may be recently behind us based on uh, some of the information I'm hearing from on our, on our team that works on the motorized chassis relationships. Uh, we're carefully monitoring that, but I, I think some of the issues we had that uh, disrupted some of our production here in the last three, four weeks uh, was due primarily to uh, some of the restart issues some of these manufacturers had, you know, coming off of their own shutdowns. And especially, as I indicated in an earlier comment, those that may have had a presence outside of the country that had some particular challenges in restarting operations as quickly as they would have liked. Um, we have great relationships with those motorized chassis suppliers, uh, and they're doing uh, everything they can uh, to increase their rates and meet our demand. Uh, but it varies by supplier uh, as to sort of the rhythm of that availability and, and the intensity of those challenges. Um, but, I, but again, as we sit here today, um, you know, we don't see any catastrophic challenges there in the near future. Um, you know, I, I do think the OEMs are, are racing to keep up with demand, um, and, uh, and I can't speak for some of the, the other competitors in the space. I just know that every day our teams are challenging whether our production rates are right based on mix uh, and based on uh, total backlog and confirmed orders, and uh, we have continued across the board to um, – on most lines, increase uh, increase our production rate pretty continuously. Uh, there have been some exceptions to that uh, as we've managed through some things, uh, but uh, I would say our business unit and operations leaders are thinking more about raising rates every day than they are about you know taking them backwards. I do believe it's going to be you know later this summer or fall when some of the OEM production. Uh, capacity can catch up, uh, you know, to potentially be in a position to stock back some of the inventory levels uh, in the dealer environment to a higher level. That will vary by segment, that will vary by manufacturer, but I think in macro we're going to spend the majority of summer racing to keep up with retail demand with our dealers, and it will be later in the year when we, as we see retail naturally seasonally slow unit-wise, that we'll be able to, I think, um, work with the dealers to reset their inventory levels to where they think they want them to be going into the back half of the year. Okay. Okay. And 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 then, uh, gentlemen, um, uh, one last question, sort of related to the portfolio and your and your balance sheet. Um, again, cash flow looking good even through the 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 the, the trough here of of the pandemic impact at this point. 
Um, uh, so uh, how do you think it, it sounded like you're, you're looking at other actions to further shore that up? Uh, and, and then along with, within context of that, how do you think about your current portfolio overall of, 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 of products uh, or, or I should say uh, uh, areas that you're, that you're, uh, that you're in? Uh, are, are you referring to our capital structure in that question, Tim, or our product um, well, portfolio? Well, capital structure one, you know, which are maybe, uh, you know, any considerations, any color you can give at this point on that as to further uh, hone and improve your, your, your balance sheet, which, which, again, it's heading in the right direction, definitely. Um, but uh, also just with assets, the assets that are in the portfolio, would there be any consideration to rebalancing divesting, downsizing, uh, you know, some areas obviously you're adding, just any, any color along that line is that would relate to, uh, uh, to, you know, maybe and then kind of marry the two there. Yeah, we continue to, um, uh, you know, monitor liquidity certainly, and we feel, as we stated in our prepared comments, pretty comfortable with our progress through the uh, quarter and the increase in cash re experience and the, as we've Cited, we also have the ABL um, to turn to, um, you know, where needed. Um, you know, I guess the only other comment I'd make, and I alluded to it, you know, we're always meeting with our strategic banking partners, evaluating our current performance, our, our near-term and longer-term uh, forward views of performance and cash generation, um, monitoring with them the capital markets to, to determine, um, you know, are there opportunities uh, for us to to uh, tap into those capital markets to just further improve our, our position, both in the near term and the longer term, and optimize that capital structure. So, you know, those conversations continue. Um, they have been live, um, you know, all along. They are heightened during the last 100 days, but um, they continue even in light of, um, you know, the strengthening um, industry uh, performance of late. Uh, how that translates into our view of the portfolio, and you know, as you know, Tim, we never comment on business development activities or the funnel. Uh, we we like our portfolio of brands, certainly. We've made that very clear, and we'll continue to evaluate, um, as we always do, how those brands are positioned and how we might uh, further strengthen the portfolio um, through the brands or uh, consider other brands that might make sense. Um, but uh, I guess that's the limit of what I would um, elaborate on there, uh, unless Mike has something to add uh, to that portfolio question. No. All right. Thank you, Great. Jim. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back to Steve Stewart for closing remarks. Thank you, operator. And thank you again, everyone, for joining our call today. We really do appreciate you spending your, your valuable time with us, and we hope that you and your family stay healthy and enjoy the outdoors this summer. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.